Okay, so good afternoon. Welcome to the Open PGP Working Group. Uh, I'm Stephen Farrell. My co-chair TKD is a large head to my left on the screen. Um, and we have 90 minutes today, so I don't think we're short of time, but we'll see how the discussion runs. Uh, so TKG, you're, you're, you have the slides open. I guess you want to advance one? Sure. Uh, so this is the note well. Go ahead. Do you, do you want to, Do you want to do it, Stephen? I can just run the slides. No, you, you, you've got the button, so you go ahead. Okay. Uh, this is the note well. We're on day two. Hopefully, you've already seen the note well. Um, just covers what uh, you're expected to do here within the IETF. A couple more slides here, breaking that down a bit further. Um, so we have hybrid meeting tips here. Uh, please make sure if you're in the room, you're connected to the Meet Echo Light client. Um, link from the data tracker agenda. If you are not in the room, um, there's just some basic tips there on how to avoid feedback and um, excessive bandwidth consumption. Um, thanks for being responsible with the masks there. Um, and one more slide here, just a reminder of the code of conduct. Um, we are aiming for courteous discussion. Um, please communicate slowly, limit the use of slang and jargon. Um, I might run afoul of some of those things myself. Uh, feel free to encourage me to correct if I do. Um, and we argue through uh, reason, not through intimidation or personal attack. And we're aiming for solutions that work for the whole internet ecosystem, not just for one particular vendor um, or one particular tech stack. Um, and we are all here to contribute to the ongoing work. So you're so this is the basic agenda that we have coming up. Um, it's a series of discussions of points that have been raised during working group last call. We've been in working group last call uh, for several months. We're now on draft 07 um, of the cryptographic refresh, which is the only chartered work item. So the main point of the meeting here today is to review the points that have been raised uh, in the working group last call. Um, and uh, if we happen to have some time at the end, uh, Aaron Wissler has offered to present uh, some material on post-quantum potential for uh, OpenPGP, which would need to be done as a recharter eventually. So, you know, if, if we have time in the session today where we've covered the issues of the work with last call and people are committed to reviewing, um, we can get into some of the other pieces. Anybody want to try to push the agenda around a little bit here? Don't see anybody attempting to bash the agenda in the room. So, and, and then also, for the recording, also we, we have note takers. Aaron and Daniel and Rick Van Rain have uh, agreed to help with notes, so we're covered for note takers and things. Thank you very much to the note takers. Okay. So, yeah. So, so DKG is going to run this because he prepared the slides and actually knows it much better than I do anyway. So, uh, so he's going to run these issues and. Again, for the note takers, if you can kind of take note of any actions or conclusions, that's the main thing. Yep. Um, so uh, the baseline, just to make sure everybody's on the same page, we had some discussion um, uh, on the list. Uh, we believe that the crypto refresh draft 07 is going to be the basis for working group work uh, going forward. Um, our goal is to avoid, we did decide on the list that there seemed to be a rough consensus towards trying to avoid conflicts with a, an alternate draft, draft Koch, um, where it's possible. Um, that will be on the agenda here today. Uh, uh, but what we also need uh, to confirm for working group last call is we need reviews. Um, as you can see from the, the slides here, several uh, interesting and useful topics have been raised in working group last call, um, but those are not the same thing as a in-depth review of what is basically a pretty lengthy document. Um, so I do encourage you, if you have an opportunity, to read through the document and give a review. Even if the review says, I've read this document and it looks good, or even better, I've implemented it, those are great reviews to have, um, but we need vocal responses, reviews on list, even from people who have been contributing to the document actively, if you can speak up with a review, that would be really important. If we can't get this out the door, this draft out the door, then we don't get to move on to any of the future work that I know some people in the group have been 
interested in pursuing. So um, that represents the state of play. I hope that that matches what everyone else has seen. I don't think there's anything new here. Just want to make sure that everybody here is um, aware of where we're at. Uh, so, so uh, if you go back one, you, so on the, can I just check uh, how many people have, or how many people would consider they're they're pretty familiar with the, the latest draft or the previous one? So I see three hands up in the room and one remote. And that kind of seems like a, not really enough, I have to say. So, so, so I'm asking how, how many people would consider they're, they're pretty familiar with draft six or draft seven of Crypto Refresh? And we had three hands in the room. One was the editor, uh, another one was a member of the design team and a colleague and a co-chair. Um, so that, that seems a little bit short. Um, would anybody be willing to kind of volunteer to do a review of the document in the next uh, number of weeks? So, uh, and, and can the note takers get their names? <laughs> so Rick is one of the note takers that volunteered himself. Uh, so at the back of the room, I didn't, I didn't. Great. Uh, and did you say yes? I thought you have put your hand up. No, you're not going to do it. <laughs> okay, so we have. And Robin is on. Robin is volunteering as well. Robin is. Okay, so he did. I didn't scroll down. Okay, so so that's good. And again, if we can get those in in the next couple of weeks, that would be fantastic. And I think he's going to put his name into Jabber. So once I see it, I'll call it out. And if it doesn't appear, I'll go grab him. Great. Okay. So and, yeah, you know, it'd be great to have those reviews. And again, if anybody has a chance to also just, I mean, I know some people are like, you, you've implemented it, but I don't know if the last time you read the whole thing. Okay. So add yourself to the list of uh, victims, please. Um, and Jonathan Hamill is the John. The other person who volunteered is Jonathan. So thank you, Jonathan. Yeah, thank you for the reviewers. It's appreciated. Does anybody else want to step off the cliff while we're all there? Everyone else is doing it. I I don't see anyone just yet. But, okay, but thank, thanks. It's important that we get those because you know stuff gets missed otherwise. So. Okay, sorry, DKJ, go ahead. No, thank you. That's uh, this is an important part of the process here. Um, so this is the, the um, one of the largest concerns that was raised on the list uh, during the most recent um, discussion, which is that there is this competing draft uh, called Draft Koch, um, which has a little bit of a confusing name, RFC 4880 bits, even though it's an individual draft, it's unlikely to actually be um, 4880 bits. Um, but it does try to use some of the similar code points and version numbers uh, to what we are using, and there, you know, the, the honest discussion was about whether or not um, it's possible for us to safely avoid conflicts with that draft, since it doesn't look like that draft is going to try particularly hard to avoid conflicts with uh, the crypto refresh. Um, so I went through the document and did a bit of a review to look for, you know, where are the places where there are actual conflicts in terms of code points. Um, and uh, the current, the slide represent, here represents my understanding of the current situation from the best that I could understand uh, um, of what's missing. The two main things are the uh, new public key format is called version five in both drafts and it, yet it, it behaves slightly differently, subtly differently. And the new signature format is called version five in both drafts and it also behaves slightly differently. Um, so one possible way that has been proposed on list uh, to uh, de-conflict is to simply move the crypto refresh draft to call those things v6. Um, uh, and that's an option. Um, so it, it would be interesting to hear from folks who uh, have an opinion on that. I will note in the right-hand column on the slide here, um, the design team already did a fair amount of work to ensure that there is no conflict on other parts of the code points. Um, 
and there's a there's a list on the side here. Uh, feel free to ask for clarifications. I don't know that I need to read through all of the details, um, but there are some subtle differences between the two drafts that already do not conflict because of the work the design team already did. So it's mainly key and signature versions that would need to change in my understanding of the two documents um, to avoid a full conflict. So I wonder whether anybody here, um, I got two questions for the room. One is, did this review miss anything? Um, and obviously we don't have to be conclusive here. Um, and two is, if this is the only thing, or if this is, is the working group interested in um, making this kind of a change to avoid a conflict? Paul, go ahead. Hi, uh, Paul Hartle, speaking as an individual. Um, I've, from a process point, I find it a little strange that the working group that basically sort of owns the IANA registries now has to see if it can use its own IANA registries because someone is squatting on the numbers. So from a process point of view, I think we should just continue going on using our registry numbers. And if anyone is squatting on them, then it's their problem, right? They should not do that. They should use private use numbers or they should uh, pick experimental numbers. Or like, like the, the fact that, that someone just unilaterally decides to use their power of deployment to sort of interfere with our registries, I think is from a, from a more principled point of view, I would just say we should ignore that. I agree that that, that could cause operational issues. Go ahead, Aaron. Um, also, I think that the points that were already conflicted were already conflicted because there was a wide deployment, or at least a deployment of these in the wild, while I think Signature version 5 is not yet. So I understand using the CPID v2, but I would not justify now switching already because someone threatens, let's say it like this. Thank you, Aaron. Uh, Daniel, I believe you're next in the queue. Yes, so Daniel Huffins, Proton. Um, I, I do want to note that uh, Werner said at some point that, well, he seemed to open to still changing um, key version 5 and signature version 5, since, yeah, as Aaron noted, it's not yet deployed. Although I worry that well, I, I'm not sure if uh, he would be open to using it in the way that the crypto refresh defines. And yeah, it would be nice if he were here, in my opinion, um, so that we could ask that question. Um, however, I, I do worry that if um, we deploy version 5 and, um, and he deploys version 5 in the way that it's currently implemented, that we'll have some incompatibilities and that, I mean, the worst case scenario I see is that we'll end up with try catches everywhere to, you know, parse one way and then if it fails, parse the other way. I, I would prefer to avoid that if at all possible. So even though I agree with the, the comments that um, we shouldn't necessarily um, throw our hands up in the air and say, okay, let's go with version six. But um, that might still be, be preferable to that outcome. Although, I mean, uh, devil's advocate would say that maybe if, if Werner's really um, um, contrary and then later he would deploy some other version six, which is a continuation of his current version five, and then we're in an even bigger mess. Although I, I would, I mean, that would be, you know, really, um, if version six is by then already deployed, I would really doubt uh, that. But um, yeah, it's something to consider. So, so, so two, two points. Um, I guess, you know, we can't really speculate as to the motivation or action of somebody who's not present. <clears throat> so I don't think there's that much point in that. The second point is that, I mean, we, you know, in the discussion as to whether to go forward with crypto refresh, I think there was a pretty clear consensus to, to go forward with crypto refresh, but also to avoid conflict where feasible. I mean, I, I think that was a, a pretty clear 
uh, outcome of that discussion, I think. So yeah. while you know, we, there might be some gritted teeth, um, but I think that, that's essentially what the, the, I think the conclusion of that fairly lengthy discussion was. So. I guess here it seems quite obvious that the avoiding conflict is feasible, but it's not 100% certain whether there's conflict yet, right? Since uh, version 5 of Werner's draft is not deployed yet, as far as I know. So I guess the question is whether we should anticipate that conflict or not. But, but again, I, I think all we have to go on is the text that he submitted in an individual draft. Okay. has a version 5, right? All right. That would be my take. But again, we, we do what the working group want. But it's, it's a tricky and undesirable situation. But uh, dealing with it is what we're here for. So, DKG, do you want to go ahead and make a proposal, or...? No, you, you, we're not getting your audio, DKG. Because... That's because yes, I was you, muted. You're back. Um, yeah. Sorry about that. So, yeah, so I will frame a concrete proposal. I'm not even sure whether I'm in favor of it or not. Um, but the concrete proposal would be to move the current draft from V5 to V6 for keys, signatures, one pass signatures, and PKESK, right? Um, so technically, we don't need to move one pass signatures and PKESK because those are already deconflicted. But the idea is if we just announce them all as version 6 all at once. The draft is sort of more coherently seen as OpenPGP version six. Um, we could also, if we wanted to, move this uh, SCIPD v two to v six if we wanted everything to be v six. Uh, but I'm I'm proposing my, the proposal I'm making here is that we leave SCIPD v two as v two, and we just change the other um, four version numbers to v six um, in the draft. So if that is one option that we could do. Um, I'm kind of tempted to do a show of hands here, whether people want to do that or actively do not want to do that. Uh, so, but so I'm not you, sure. Whether that's... Yeah, so well, it just as a suggestion, could, could you type that into the chat uh, and let people digest it for a moment? And yep, doing that now. Great. So, so, so keep an eye on the chat. Uh, And even if you need a moment to digest it, if you want to get in on the mic line, then please feel free to join the queue right now. And I guess we will at some point ask if people want to proceed along that route, depending on discussion between now and then. OK. so. So DK, I'll just read it out in case somebody's not in the chat. So DKG's proposal to, to see what people want to do is to say, move the version number from V5 to V6 for key, signature, OPS, and PKESK. And now is the time to jump in the mic line if you have, if you want to say yes, if you want to say no, if you want to say I don't know, I don't have enough information, those are all things to, to, that would be valid to hear. Okay, okay. Uh, Paul speaking. So, so just one note then. So I don't want to end up in a match about who has the latest, newest, shiniest version, right? Because if a response could be that then the, 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 the person from version 5 will bump to version 8 or something so that they are seen as the latest version, then we're going to jump this game in a number of iterations. So, so, so I mean, it kind of depends a little bit on if we can get word of saying like, this person is going to stick with version five or not. Like, so for us to make any decision beforehand seems a bit silly to me. So I, I, I guess again, I, I, I think I would disagree with you, Paul, on the basis that we seem to have a demonstrated uh, evidence that we're not going to get that information. We could try. You know, certainly after after the when we when we're posting the minutes to this, we can certainly try to see if there's anything any new information to be had. I suspect the answer will be there won't be anything concrete. 
And there is information in the form of a draft of, of draft book that says, here's what we plan to do for version, what we will do for version five. Um, I, I agree so, so with, we, with Paul with Paul that like version number escalation is a silly, silly outcome. <laughs> I, I, yes. I'm not proposing V6 because it's bigger than V5. I'm proposing it because it's different than V5. Yeah, I, I wonder whether it's worth doing a show of hands here. Um, and I think we were just in the cusp of an AD interrupt, so let's let's take that one first. <clears throat> Hi, Roman Nelu, Carnegie Mellon University, not as AD. I, okay. I wanted to just to kind of ask, we're, we're worried about this version escalation. Do we care? We specified six, so someone else says seven. If we got to do something else, we'll do eight, so we have a lower version number. I mean, could someone explain why that's a problem other than, I guess, this idea of semantic versioning, higher is newer? I'm not aware of a concrete problem. I mean, Depends on how we play the game, right? I mean, there there are 256 versions. We have a one octet version number in multiple places here. So I guess it could get super silly there, but um, I don't think anyone is proposing to do that level of escalation. No. Yeah, I mean, there's certainly a code point space to manage. The reason why I make that comment is just, I'm fresh off, uh, you know, out of the quick working group. They are defining quick V2, whose, I, whose version number is not V2, but that's the name of the draft. And from talking with them, there's no guarantee in the future that the, the, how big or small the number is you know, indicates any lineage or kind of sequence. I wonder whether we can just do something like that to make progress. Yes, so I, I, I don't think we have a huge blocker here. Um, you know, it is the case that it's easier for quick to, to, to upgrade versions than for a store and forward thing, but, uh, but yeah, I don't think it's a huge deal. So, so OK. I don't see other people joining the mic line. So should we try the poll tool and see what if people think DKG's suggestion as typed into the chat is worth pursuing? I'm going to do that now. Oh, he's done it already. Uh, so in that case, ra raise, raise your hand or click the raise hand button if you agree with the proposal that DKG floated for how to handle versions. And click the do not raise hand button if you disagree with that proposal. And don't click anything if you are unsure or don't feel like you, you want to make the decision. I, I, I'll ask that question after. And yes, you can change it. If you change your mind, it, the, 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 the totals will change. <clears throat> OK, so that seems to have stabilized at about 12, at, for the record, at 12. 13 raised hands, a zero do not raise hands, which is pretty clear. And is, at ITF 114, we had a bunch of polls and we had similar kind of numbers for some of the meaty discussions. So it kind of indicates there's something sane. Would anybody like to kind of speak to not being ready to kind of decide that or needing more information or other things that the poll tool doesn't capture? I mean, so just the only thing, um, as I said, as I've, as far as I understood, Werner was still open to changing things. Um, I think if, um, if we can reach out and ask if Werner would be okay with changing, um, his definition of V5 keys and signatures to the crypto refresh definition so that we can stay with V5 and have more interoperability. And I think that would still be preferable and perhaps worth trying. Sure, I'm happy to take an action to try that. Um, so once, once we have outcomes in this meeting in terms of minutes and so on, I'll, I'll certainly reach out and bring any new information back to the list. Thanks. So yeah, for the minutes, you can note that it's an action on me to try and follow up with that. And I'm assuming that that process, uh, Stephen, would have some termination date if we don't get any response, yeah? Yeah, I and mean, we can't just wait indefinitely. Uh, uh, Samuel so in the chat is asking if it's possible to remove one's vote. I'm not sure what that means. Uh, is Samuel can, remote or present? I don't know. 
Uh, you, so you can change your mind during the poll um, by just click, you know, just toggle the, the, the radio button. But I ended the poll, so too late. Sorry. Rick. Rick, go ahead. <clears throat> Rick von Rijn, uh, personal here. Um, I think the point is that we're not dealing with versions but variants here. So V5 should be, or V6 should be, be read variant 6 and they can coexist. Because that's actually what the software does. It just uses it as a switch deck. It's not like A is large than B. Yeah. So the race for version, I think, doesn't exist. Sure. Okay. So I think we, is there anything on the right hand side of DKG's slide? that people uh, would disagree with or, or think requires some more discussion here? Or is he correct about these deconflicts having been done already? So, yeah, I don't see anybody looking like they're, I see a bunch of people who don't know, like me, <laughs> but I trust DKG to get it right. Um, I don't see anybody sort of saying that there is something on the right-hand side of the slide that we may need to decide on right now. Okay, so I think you're safe to go to the next one. Okay. And thank, thank you for polling and so on. Yep. So uh, one of the issues that came up during working group last call was from Aaron, who I believe is in the room. Um, we have, uh, there's links in the slide if you want to look at the slides to a mailing list thread and to an open um, issue in GitLab. Um, the proposal was to try to, so currently, the version five signatures, which may be version six if we do this change, everything here still assumes baseline version five on these slides. Um, they have a salt, a 16 octet salt, and Aaron was recommending moving that to a larger salt in preparation for some of the post quantum signing schemes that need a larger salt. Um, uh, Aaron offered sort of menu of options. Either all the salts could be larger, or you could make the salt variant in size based on like the hash algorithm. Um, and I wonder whether folks want to speak to that. Scott, you're in the queue. <clears throat> uh, yes, I just happen to be have looked at uh, the various post quantum uh, signature algorithms. Uh, they all, ha all three of them have some uh, uh, some prefix in front of it, much larger than 16 uh, octets. Um, some of them uh, based either based on the public key values or just some random values that the signer picks. Now, uh, you could either build that into the uh, uh, one pass signature me message or uh, just another possibility is just do maybe a, salted, a standard salted hash like you have here and then have the, the and just have the verifier then do a standard a signature verification on the uh, on the hash. And so avoid uh, getting into the details of how Sphinx, uh, uh, Dialysis, and Falcon work. So my understanding is that with OpenPG, you always do. Uh... Yes, that, that's, that, that's an alternative that is one, certainly, certainly one possibility. So you're saying then that for the post-quantum schemes, they would, it, their signature packet would contain uh, a salt. That salt would be prepended to the digest, the open PGP style digest. So you don't need to, uh, you don't need it in the one pass signature packet in that case. Uh, I, I well, it, 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 uh, it's a little more complex because it, uh, uh, sometimes it's, it's depending on the algorithm, it's either in the signature or in the public key. I think maybe Aaron wants to speak to that. I see him in the queue. Okay. Yeah, so Aaron's behind you there, Scott. But don't, but don't, don't go far from the mic, probably. <laughs> so also in the next presentation mm -hmm. slides, I have something about this very problem. The lithium, for instance, has the prepends with the, the public key, while Sphinx has a ran, an optional random salt. The idea would be basically to disable the optional random salt into Sphinx, for instance. Yes. Yeah, to the sign, yeah. So it. Sorry, and can, you, uh, can you use the mic? The mic 
because uh, those of us who are not uh, present. Just, just a correction how sinks works. Uh, it has the option, the optional salt is to the signer. The signer always picks a random value. It's just that is it this, uh, the the signer may use a optional random to to further randomize it or go with a default. Uh, the verifier doesn't know or care. So yeah, it, it can be extracted from random or from the message. Uh, but like the the issue, the following is the fact that Sphinx, for instance, has a 16 octet sold for the lowest security level. Uh, then 24 and 32 octets. Um, the, the lithium case, I think it would be fine still with the pre, with this construction because you still apply the the public key at the prefix of then a hash. So you basically hash together the, the public key and then the already derived uh, hash that you're signing from OpenPGP. Um, the the request here comes. There are these two options. Either we want to make this sim simple implementation and put 32 octets for everything, or whether we want to bind it to the hash algorithm, in my opinion, because the thing we're trying to, uh, to solve, the issue we're trying to solve is a collision into the hash uh, when signing. And we need an unpredictable salt for uh, whoever is signing, for whoever is creating the signature. So, so Aaron, uh, Jonathan's in the queue behind you. Uh, Jonathan Hamill. So uh, I, I think that you, you kind of want to take the crypto algorithm outputs uh, from the libraries as opaque so that you don't have to be parsing them out in order to fit them into the PGP structures, would be my opinion. Okay. So I, I, I had a question, I guess, perhaps for Aaron. So, uh, so my question is, if we made this change now, would we still have to make other changes around this space later when we actually come to specify PQC? So if we bind it to the hash algorithm, I still have a proposal later when we do PQC to bind the hash algorithm to the public key algorithm in signature. For instance, first, like the lithium uses SHA-3 internally, using SHA-2 and then SHA-3 would be, in my opinion, a bad idea. So you expand the, the, the attack surface. Um, still, I think that it makes sense to do this change now because the hash algorithm that we define into V5 would mean doing, uh, basically, we would already have longer salts for existing hash algorithms. And if instead we want to buy directly to the public key, public key algorithm, then that's fine. We can just do it later. I don't know if, is it clear? Or? So my concrete proposal is binding the signature uh, salt length to the hash algorithm used to derive that salt, to derive that, that signature. So you use SHA-256, uh, SHA you have a 16 octet salt. You use SHA-512, you get a 32 octet salt. And yeah, that's the action so, item now. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I have a, a, if we're going to bind to the hash algorithm used, then um, it seems like one other option would be to <clears> say <throat> that you get a different hash algorithm um, for we could introduce a novel hash algorithm specifically for the post quantum stuff, right? So for for um, if sorry, you could you, larger... can, I, can, can I just do an interrupt there? Uh, I just wanted to capture Aaron's suggestion. Uh, so I, I put what I think that is into the chat, and then you know I, I guess we're building up towards a poll with like two or three options or something, right? Um, I think that's right. So, Aaron, did I get that right? And if, if not, please correct it. In particular, okay, sorry, you... in particular, I think Aaron's proposal was that the salt length would be the length of the hash algorithm in the signature. Um, so, okay. I'll note so that. The, so DKG's variation. If, 
just uh, um, what I just heard about dilithium, which is needing to hash the public key material in as well, doesn't line up with OPPGP's um, uh, one pass signature framing. Because the one pass signature doesn't know anything about what pub, pub key algorithm is going to be used. It only does the um, uh, it only does a digest before calculation. Aaron, yeah, please come to my So when you hash, as far as understood, when you hash at first, like the, when you start a hash with prefix a hash with the public key, that is not meant to avoid collision because the public key is known. So an attacker could just like, doesn't need that. Like it's not meant there for collision is therefore channel binding, let's say. So, if, even if we put the, if we use it later in the hash, within the opaque algorithm, let's say, it's it's fine. I think in my opinion. Okay. So, so, um, so the current proposal is that we bind it to the hash out. We bind the length to the hash algorithm, and it, it is the length of the hash algorithm output. So is that correct, Aaron? That the the length you want is exactly the same length as the hash output. Um, it's it's actually the security level of the hash, so it's half of the length because of the collisions thing. So I think the Shadow of physics has a 32 octet, and we use 16 and so on. Got it. OK. So let me propose um, a, a separate variant, just to see if people have a preference here. Um, which is that we add a column to the hash algorithms table that says the length of the salt for this hash algorithm is x. And then if you encounter, and, and we set them all initially to 16 octets. And then if you have a post-quantum algorithm, we say, oh, you need a special hash We'll bind a, a we'll, we'll allocate a new point in the space, and it'll be SHA-3256 with longer hash. And it has the same code path, but it lets us put a larger hash in when we need it. And we don't, if we don't know what the larger hash is now, <clears throat> we can just put the larger hash in later instead of. And my second question here, so I'm proposing this because I want to ask also: are, Is there going to be a problem if we bind it to the hash algorithm if something doesn't know a given hash algorithm? If, How's it going to know? Will it be able to deal well with a, a, si a salt of unknown size? Well, obviously, if they don't know the hash algorithm, they can't actually verify any signatures. Um, on the other hand, sure. I don't see the why is they're making distinction between post quantum and non post quantum in terms of salt size. The attack they're, they're addressing, uh, collisions, are, it's the same in both, both cases. Okay. So, do we have do we have any? Uh, yep, yeah. Quinn. I um Quinn Dang at NIST. Um, I've been confused for the whole time. So I, uh, so uh, the the thing is uh, for the lithium and for Falcon, the for the Falcon the uh, the salt is the fixed size, and that's come along with the message when you hash it. For the, the lithium, the salt is basically the internal value, which can be either derived from a part of the public key, or you could make a, a fresh or truly random value as a salt internally for the signing. But the, but the signature itself does not have any salt. And also even internally, that salt is a fixed value, 5 12 bits long. So that's why I've been confused. I don't really know what the discussion we have been talking about. I think part and of the for, problem that we're having here is that OpenPGP has an expected uh, frame for all signatures, where it does a digest, and then the digest is passed to a public key algorithm. And that is a peculiarity of OpenPGP and not a frame that we have uh, proposed uh, breaking should new algorithms come along. I don't think this is the right time for us to figure out how to do post-quantum exactly. The, the, the goal for right now is to figure out 
what should we do about the salts themselves um, uh, so that we don't okay. have too much breakage when we get to, to P2 stuff. OK, thanks. Mike Ellsworth. So I think Quinn's point, if I heard it properly, is the PQ signatures have built-in salts. You could have no salt here, and they're still secure, so it doesn't matter. Is that what you were arguing? Uh, so I'm talking about signature alone. The, uh, the Falcon needs a salt, must have a salt, and the salt is fixed in the spec, the false lens fixed in, in the spec. But the lithium signature does not contain a salt, but internal signing, there must be a pseudo random uh, number of bit string of five terabits long, or you have a truly random bit string five terabits long used in the signing uh, procedure. That's what I'm saying. So I don't. And of course, if you do a spring plus, you need your salt. You need the random values. That are, yeah. So, so I, I think my, so my, uh, my understanding, which is probably worse than most people in the room, is that D, PGP is already hashing the, the, the message. And it's only the hash that's going to be fed into the new signature algorithm. So now we want to also add a hash from, from the PGP protocol plus a salt from the PGP protocol and get that signed. And whether the, the signing algorithm involves other salts or other randomness is a, a different matter. I, I just tried to clarify what my said. So, so that what I said would have been correct. So I, I did not mean anything. I just corrected what my uh, echo, what I said. OK. I, I think that um, like the lithium, as far as understood, contains the, it's, it's meant to randomize the signature. It's not meant as a salt to avoid collision. Basically, what the, the attack we're trying to, uh, to thwart here is the following. I create a second text that hashes to the same result as the first text. So we have two, uh, and this basically lowers the security on the whole setting because, um, we instead of uh, instead of just uh, the hash, if if we use a, an unpredictable salt, we just need second pre image resistance onto the hash. While instead, if we just use an unsalted salt, unsalted hash, we uh, need collision resistance into the hash. And we have seen with Shawan that collision resistance can disappear. <laughs> Let's say it like this. Um, so I think that uh, this is just. Uh, like a, a, a little change to match the security level of uh, of, uh, of of Sphinx Plus. I personally think that 16 octet salt being it an online attack, so you need a, 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 someone to sign that message many times till you get the right salt, is still a very large value. So I see the value into DKG's proposal. I just don't like it personally because I think it is uh, like it creates another edge case. Instead, if you s bind everything to the hash algorithm, no matter is, if it's post or pre-quantum, I think it's better. But that's a personal opinion. OK, and Mike? Mike Answorth. Yeah, totally agree with what Aaron said. I mean, it's, it's yeah, the internals of dilithium are to prevent, for internal reasons, not are not intending to be um, collision resistance. Um, personal vote, DKG, I would say just go ahead with this. This is well into splitting hairs. Um, I'd also want to point out, this is a perfect, I mean, you've sort of stepped in a bear trap. This is a perfect topic for Roman's new PQC working group because everyone's going to have to face this question of whether we pre-hash dilithium and falcon or not. And if we pre-hash it, do we salt it or not? And this is going to come up absolutely everywhere. We, we nonetheless don't want to wait for that. So, so, so I think we have three options. One is the status quo, which is a fixed length 16 octet salt. Uh, Robin Another, oh, pardon me, Robin, go ahead. Uh, hi, is the, is the mic working? Yep. OK. Um, yeah, just sorry to, to preempt your, your summary. Um, if I remember correctly, a few ITFs back, 
uh, CFRG, I think it was, was discussing a a dual or hybrid signature scheme where you would have an algorithm that was thought probably not to be post-quantum safe um, and one that you thought was post-quantum <coughs> safe and you would actually doubly sign uh, things that you wanted to sign um, with the goal that you'd you'd have compatibility you'd have legacy compatibility because of the non-safe uh, algorithm until such time as you wanted to stop using that or had to stop using it but you would be signing things now with an algorithm thought to be post-quantum safe um, and the, the the driver of that was simply uh, the length of time for which you might want a signed object a signed artifact to persist so is there an alternative here to say treat these different salt lengths as um, if you like probably not quantum safe and probably quantum safe variants and do a dual signing Aaron uh, you are like reading my slides that come in the next presentation this is another topic so i would like to say maybe of this length of salt we could discuss after the second presentation because there is a better explanation there and also the idea of signing twice with the pre and a post quantum key so so yes and no uh, so we're not chartered to do work on post quantum crypto so we need exactly. to make this decision regardless um so I, i'm going to suggest that we have a, a try a poll with three options one is the status quo which is a fixed length 16 octet salt the second is the proposal aaron made where the salt length is tied to the collision resistance size of the hash. And the third proposal is, I think, what DKG suggested, is that we add a column to the IANA registry for each signature type, for each, for each signature algorithm, that we have a salt length parameter in the registry. I think that's, that's a, a lot of work. I just want to, I, I want to, yeah. I want to point out that I think we'll need a column for the registry in either case. Uh, because the registry needs to know what is the collision resistance of each algorithm. I mean, if you're an expert in the algorithms, you know what that is, but we will need the table in any case. The question is whether we want the yeah. table to exactly, whether we want the column to match the collision resistance. And okay. uh, given the discussion, I, I'm definitely not, I'm no longer interested in my counter proposal. I, I, I'm, I've been convinced by the speakers. Uh, oh, okay. So proposal, DKG's proposal was withdrawn. Does anybody else want to put DKG's proposal back on the table? <laughs> okay, so then we have two proposals. One is Aaron's suggestion that the salt length is tied to the collision resistance of the hash function. And the second one is the status quo where we have a 16 octet salt. Do you want to start the poll, DKG, or should I? Um, uh, I can start. Okay, so we have um, two options, status quo or Aaron's suggestion. So raise your hand if you think we should have the collision, the salt length match the collision resistance of the hash function. And do not raise hand if you think we should uh, stick with the status quo. And if you want to abstain, you do that by abstaining. <laughs> okay, so just that could get confusing. So I'm going to say it again, just to make sure I got it right. So if you raise your hand, if you want Aaron's proposal to make the salt lengths the, the collision resistance size of the hash and click the do not raise your hand if you'd like to stick with the status quo of a fixed 16 octet salt. And it seems to be stable and relatively clear. And we have 15 raised hands and one not raised hand. Uh, it, it's useful to check with the person who, who clicked do not raise hand, would they like to say at the microphone why? Uh, that, can, that can be helpful information. Uh, yes, this is me. Uh, the reason is that why is there a salt there if it's to provide to provide collision resistance, which means that a, coll a collision would apply, uh, would apply only if they managed to guess the salt first. And someone blindly guessing a 16 octet value is, is sufficiently improbable not to worry about. 
Okay, so thanks for that. Um, e even Aaron is nodding with that, but we, we picked something, so let's, let's, let's not uh, grab defeat from the jaws of victory. Uh, um, I would like to uh, request someone to volunteer to make a, a, a merge request. I mean, Paul, if you're okay with making the, the edit yourself, that's fine, but if you would rather have somebody propose a merge request, uh, Aaron has said he would make merge. Great. Okay. okay. So, we are we are way over time for this question, so I'd like to move on to the next one. Unless, yeah, uh, Robin, you're still in the queue, or do you want to take yourself out of the queue? Okay. Please go. All right. Um, so on GitLab, this has actually not been brought to the mailing list. That's a failure of your chairs here. Sorry, I failed to bring this to the mailing list uh, when it came up. Um, Demi Marie Obenauer noted that. As currently described, a version five signature uh, over a message that is less than four gigabytes in length can be transformed into a version three signature over subtly different data, uh, but signed by the same key. So it is possible for an attacker to take a version five key and a version five signature, extract the cryptographic key material from the key, transform it into a V3 key, and then make take the take the V five signature and uh, apply it to uh, a, a weird variation of the text uh, that was originally signed, and the signature will still validate for those things that validate V three. Um, there is a fix <laughs> proposed on that issue, um, which just changes the way that the trailer is computed for the V five uh, hash. Um, uh, the draft already says you should, you, I think it says you must not validate V3 signatures uh, because we believe them to be insecure. Um, so it's not clear that we need to do this. Uh, on the other hand, the change is not particularly big. It just basically moves some bytes around to prevent the, the signature from being aliased in the same way. Um, be relatively easy to do the change uh, and avoid it for those things that are failing at their uh, rejecting V3 signatures. Um, I don't know who else. I know, I know that there are at least a few people who have read this issue um, and commented on it. I think Eustace is there um, uh, and, and has, has read and commented on it. I don't know whether anybody else wants to speak to this or not. Um, if we were to do a poll on it, the poll would be uh, should we change the trailer of V5 signatures to avoid any possible aliasing with V3 signatures? Uh, yes, Robin, you, you are reading that correctly. Uh, the, the issue here is that V5 signatures hash a trailer that consists of an eight octet size value um, of the message and V4 uh, signature, V3 signatures as a trailer hash the timestamp of the signature pre prefixed by the, the signature type. So as long as, as long as the fifth octet from the end is a zero, then the remaining bits will appear as a timestamp when you interpret this, the hashed stream as a V3, uh, as a V3 signature. This is a weird thing. It's not clear that we have a specific attack, uh, but that's the uh, that's where the four gigabyte uh, boundary comes from. This is not an issue for v4 because v4 hashes the um, file size at the end, uh, but it, before the file size comes a zero x ff uh, octet, and there is no signature type zero x ff. Okay. Uh, does anybody think they're in a position to? Well, does anybody need more information um, before having an opinion on this, or do you think you have enough information? I see a whole bunch of non-reactions, so I don't know what the answer is. <laughs> uh, so do people gonna, need? I'm going to start. I'm going to start a poll here, and if nobody votes in the poll, um, or if like three people vote in the poll, we will know that nobody has has made a decision there, and that will be information we can take to the list later. Does that sound okay? Okay. 
Okay, so your poll will be, okay, go ahead and say it. change. Change the V5 signature trailer octet ordering. So the V5 signature trailer has a certain octet ordering and uh, open hours proposal is to change the ordering of the trailer octets in a way that would make it uh, impossible to alias with a V3 signature. And, and the instruction is to raise your hand if you want that change. Raise your click hand if you not, want the change. Click do not raise your hand if you do not want, if you oppose the change. And if you're not sure, please don't click anything. Daniel, go ahead. So we don't support uh, V3 signatures anymore already since a long time and haven't had major issues as far as I'm aware. So I don't have a particularly strong opinion on this. I'm, I'm fine with changing it. I'm also fine with not changing it. So I, yeah. Okay, so we, we, we have a kind of a weaker distribution here. Uh, we have two hands, two people click do not raise hand. Do you want to say why, that'd be good? I think that signature verification is something that is on the receiver's end and does not break, like you can still read the message if it doesn't verify. So the fact of not very validating V3 signatures is something that is necessary. And since it's a must, I think that it's, it's good not to like to, to ban on V3 verifications and do not change this. So there is a weird case where the signature, the data being signed is large enough that the fifth octet of its size is 0xff um, and the sixth octet of its size is 0x04. So a signature over that data would alias from a V5 signature to a V4 signature potentially. That's a much rarer case. There's, you have to be signing uh, exabytes of data, <laughs> but there is a weird aliasing situation there where the signature would be identical. Okay, Rick. So it is not just V3, but V3 is much more much easier. Is there a reason why you're not hashing in when you while you're hashing before the signature? Why you why you're not hashing in the version number of the signature? This version number of the signature is hashed, but it's hashed in the trailer. And the position in the trailer varies depending on the signature version. <laughs> uh, and so that's that's why we have this aliasing problem. If the if the version number was hashed in at the beginning, then uh, we would not have this issue. The trouble is that that we have this this regular pattern this, this pattern of changing. Open hours proposal would make it so that um, the version of the signature is always a fixed length from the end of the hashed stream. Uh, whereas right now, V3 doesn't have a version number in it. Uh, V4 has a version number at the sixth octet from the end, and V5 has a version number at the uh, ninth octet from the end. Yeah, so basically, uh, sorry, you said, from the end. so basically saying if I had a dump of what goes into ha to the hash, I could parse back, I could parse out the, the version number. That That should work. Um, you know, the concern is we have the sequence of data that goes into the hash. If we know that that sequence of data is a version is a version three signature, there is no way to find that it is version three from that sequence. If we know that the signature is a V4 signature, we find the version number from the sixth octet from the end. If we know that it's a V5 signature, we find the version number from the 10th octet from the end in the current proposal. But if you don't know those things and you're looking at the sequence and trying to figure out what version it is, you could, it, it's possible for the one octet string to land on something that could be interpreted in the same way. So open hours proposal makes, makes it so that there is a fixed location in the hash stream that cannot, so that the, the data hash for V4 and V5 cannot collide and V3 also cannot collide. Okay, so so again, just as a time check, we've got a half hour left. So there's a couple of other issues yeah. to get to. I, I I think we have you know we have input on this. Um, it, it's clearly in one direction. We have eight raised hands and two not raised for the record. Uh, it's a little bit less strong than previous. Um, so I, I guess the action here will 
be to make that change, uh, but be open to somebody on the list um, raising new information in the next short while. So then the question will be, yep. uh, do, does that, was that an issue or a merge request? That's an issue, not a merge request. Okay, so we need somebody to turn it into a merge request. Anybody want to help by doing that? Nobody here in I'll the room? I'll for this one. Okay, DKG will handle that. Great. So again, we've got a half hour to go, so let's tootle along. Uh, Marcus Brinkman. I, I'm so, sorry, DKG, just on, on the timing thing, I think we, we, we do want to keep a, a reasonable amount of time yep. to talk about the Angana stuff, yeah? So, which I think is your yes, last slide. Do. Sorry about that. Um, yep. So Marcus Brinkman recommended a context parameter for encryption to ensure that things could not be decrypted in uh, surprising contexts. Uh, this is part of the work on defending against e-fail. Um, Daniel Huygens recommended uh, that if we're going to add a constant parameter for encryption, we could add it for signatures too, so that signatures do not verify in surprising contexts. Um, however, doing this requires a, defi a shared definition of a context, and no one has proposed, well, Brinkman proposed a specific context for email signatures, um, but it is not clear if we would be able to use a V5 signature for email without this context um, in, uh, like this might delay the, the adoption of the additional signatures um, or additional encryption, of, of using the signatures or encryption um, if we don't have the context well-defined for any particular location. For example, if you're doing backups. Um, so there's a question of, do we want the context parameter in the current, uh, to, to come out in the crypto refresh or is it something that we can postpone to future work? Um, anybody want to speak to this? Daniel? Yes, so I'm uh, uh, quite in favor of this, as you know. And uh, I think for, for me, uh, this is most important, possibly for new applications that might want to use OpenPGP that um, want to ensure that uh, messages or signatures can be, um, let's say, transplanted into different contexts, contexts um, or different applications. So ha having even just uh, uh, an application identifier in the context, plus, uh, in my opinion, having some application-specific um, context parameter that that can be defined in in um, you know the application's usage of OpenPGP would be very useful. I do also agree that for email, moving to um, a shared understanding of what the context should be is a lot of work and um, it's not clear that we can do that like um, you know in in the next few weeks or so uh, but um, nevertheless I think it would be valuable to add uh, context parameters in the spec um, so that uh, new applications can start using it and uh, and then we can separately think about how to um, move email to that. So, 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 so just it, it, is what you're suggesting then is that we have a, a you know a default context parameter that we define that has a you know a fixed value for now, and then we ask new applications to define context parameters themselves as they go forward. Yeah. Yes. So that could be one option. Uh, another option could be to to have a, a registry, as I, I think DKG perhaps suggested, having a registry of application identifiers, and then we could um, still already define one for email, just so that um, uh, signed messages, uh, messages and signatures for email are, are separate and can be transplanted to other applications, but, and, and then have after that uh, an application specific um, context parameter that we could figure out later 
what that should be for email and each other application, if that makes sense. Okay, so, so, so essentially proposal registry with, I guess, two initial values, one for email, one for default. Sorry, one for? Default. Ah. I guess it might be worth doing some work to, to find out where everywhere uh, that OpenPGP is used is, and maybe we need more than just email, but. Okay, so I, I yeah. That's starting to sound like a bunch of work, but uh, so Rick, you're in the way. <laughs> Rick van Rijn responding to Daniel's proposal. Um, I like the ab ability to separate uh, applications. You mentioned a registry. Is that a deliberate proposal? Or is that just something that pops up? Because it means you, uh, you require a lot of extra work for registering. You could also consider an OID, which anyone could register, or a UUID, which is e even simpler. These are not security attributes anyway. So that's good to think about what form of identity you want to use. So one concern is that if the um, context travels in the open PGP material, then we're not actually gaining anything from this proposal in terms of security, because they'll just try whatever the context is there, and then the attacker can modify the context. So what the reason for the registry, I believe, is to coordinate among users to say, oh, I get it, I'm in this context, I'm gonna use this particular uh, uh, machinery. Um, my concern there, even if we just have an, a registry that's email and not email, is if I send you an email with an attachment that is PGP encrypted, should it be decrypted with the email context or should it be decrypted without the email context? I don't actually know what that means. So, so and the registry's job is to coordinate that kind of thing. So I don't, I'm just saying, I don't, if we're doing a registry, I still, like, I kind of think it's necessary, but I also don't even know what would go in the registry. So if someone wants to propose that, I'm, I'm game to read it over and try to review. Um, so we, you want to do a poll on this? I mean, the, so the, the other option that was, the other option that was mentioned in the discussion on list was we can just say, we know that there, we know where the context would go in these constructions, both for encryption and for signatures. And we could say, you know, the null context is what we're defining here. And if somebody wants to define a particular context in which a, a, um, the thing should be used and what the context string should be, we can just simply define a V3 SCIPD and figure out how to signal that the end user supports that as a separate work in the rechartered uh, working group. So that's another way forward. So thinking about it from a getting finished point of view, that, that last option sounds more attractive to me as a, just a, you know, from, as a chair and getting finished. Um, uh, so so I, don't, I don't know, should we do a poll on this or not? I, I think, how about a proposal? If we, if we were to just punt on this and, and come back to it later if, in, as part of rechartering, would that be okay with people? Would anybody object to that? So nobody seems to be objecting in the room or the chat. So perhaps that's one to- Do you wanna say, you you say, say your proposal again and we can put it as a poll? The proposal is we punt and consider this as part of rechartering. So no poll. Oh, okay. I mean, nobody's okay. objecting. Okay. So. Okay. <laughs> <coughs> okay. So I, right. I will suggest we'll move on. The minutes will be posted to the list. Yep. So, on. Um, so Andre Jivsov recommended in uh, uh, on the mailing list and in GitLab. Uh, that for V5 public keys for ECDH and ECDSA, we could move from the SEC1 um, uh, uh, representation to a more compact X only representation. Um, that would mean that the public key format would differ for these things between version four and version five, or version six if we call it version six. Um, uh, I don't know if folks want to have folks want to comment on this. Um, I am against this specifically because we kept a hack in uh, the EC, 
the ED2559 and also the Curve2519 implementation to be consistent with V4. And in general, I don't see that much advantage in switching to X only representation when we have one more issue than computing the point. Sec1 is not so compact, but it, we're still talking about elliptic curve keys. So I don't really see an advantage in, 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 in bandwidth. So do we do we have anybody who wants to speak for this change? I'm going to start a poll then for move from sec one representation to X only representation for ECTH and ECTSA. Um, so raise your hand if you want to move to X only and do not raise your hand. That is click the do not raise hand button if you want to retain the SEC1 rep uh, representation for V5 keys. Sorry, I, the, the text of the poll should say for V5 keys only. Okay, so that seems to have stabilized. That's uh, zero raised hands, nine hands not raised. So essentially status quo. Okay, cool. Thanks, folks. Moving on. Uh, oh, Ori, I see you on the list there. Uh, hey, uh, Ori Steele, Transmute. Um, just because this issue has come up on several other lists, if you have interacted on any of those other lists and you feel the same way as you voted in this context, please share your opinions on those other lists. I'm thinking specifically of the cozy lists regarding key types and key representations in Hosey and Cozy. Thank you. Sure. Cozy has kind of different requirements to PGP, though. So, OK, moving on. OK, this is our um, last chartered topic for this meeting, um, which is about how we handle the IANA updates. Um, we had a poll about this at the last meeting. Um, and you can see the results of that poll in uh, issue 140 on GitLab. Um, this is a reminder, the crypto refresh is going to change almost all the registries <clears throat> to specification required, which means we will have a designated expert whose job is to determine whether something is a sufficient specification. Um, the only two registries that will remain RFC required are for version numbers, um, wherever they show up in the spec, and packet types. So the packet type numbers will both require an RFC. So that's a higher bar to meet. Um, this is a reminder that that's, you know, I think we had a rough consensus on this move at the last one, and we've talked about this for over a year now. Um, but when I just like to confirm that that's what we want to do. And we also are going to need people to volunteer to be designated experts, or maybe uh, who would be willing, people could identify themselves as being willing to be designated experts. And I believe we will need to choose those designated experts. Stephen, I think you so and the, I the, the ISG oh, yeah. will make that choice. So the, the, we, okay. Yeah. So, so the ISG make this choice uh, because it, it it can outlast the working group and so on. So it's not, it's not our call, but we can certainly uh, provide input to the ISG. And if people are willing to, to volunteer for it, great. Uh, so please do that. Uh -huh. But I guess the more the more interesting question for today is what guidance should be included in the specification for those experts? And typically, the guidance is around you know what level of specification is consist considered okay. Uh, is it okay to have a random web page? Is it okay to have an academic publication that may not be great for interop, uh, et cetera? So. And this is a topic where people don't get excited until it's too late. Um, so I think it would be good to get some input. And it gets too late when somebody proposes that they want to add something based on what we turn out not to like later. Aaron. Given the history of OpenPGP, I would say that a draft uh, is probably what we want. Like we have, like WKD is a draft, uh, the PKS is a draft. Like they're all the things that are a bit related to OpenPGP and they all seem to be drafts. So you're suggesting an internet draft 
Yeah. Okay, which can be submitted that has like a personal internet path is fine, or? That's where we are at. <laughs> I don't know whether that's a good idea, but that's the status quo probably. Okay. Ori? Uh, or still uh, transmute. Um, I agree with what he said. You said about it being any web page on the internet, not that. Okay, um, so something that's so just to point out that internet drafts are mutable documents, right? Uh, mutability is, is fine. Mostly about availability and like sure. posted uh, in a in a context where it's not going to go away. So if if we were to consider any person's random web page on the internet, I would ask for it to be like the ar internet archived version of that page or something durable. Yeah, I want to jump in in line. Uh, there are former in real IDs kind of also in, in this room. By my read, specification required is not really an ID because to your point, it's mutable. Yeah. Just pointing that out. So, so especially we, we have a concern about mutability and about um, uh, rely like reliability, like being able to find it, that it doesn't disappear, right? Which is, I guess, a, an extreme type of mutability. Do folks have an opinion about whether we need something like interoperability? Like, could you know, I can publish any garbage as an internet draft, um, and it's out there, and I can say, oh, just use version 02 of my, um, you know, thing, but that doesn't mean anybody else has actually done it before. Do you want to ask the designated expert to ensure that there are two implementations from different implementers? No, for example. So just a yeah, not commenting on the implementation, just a kind of comment on the ID draft to sensitize everyone a way to write the considerations. Uh, you know, IDs can change. You can also do, uh, I'm sorry, you, you can do kind of specification required, which can mean IETF stream. It can also mean ISC. So that means, you know, you're not going through the working group. Uh, and so when we say RFC required, I'm actually not sure which one we need. Uh, is that standards action, so IETF stream? Or is that any kind of RFC? So that's currently, I think it's any kind of RFC. Um, it's also, you know, it's worth noting as well that there, you know, there is, uh, there are some specification required registries already, and I don't believe a designated expert was ever appointed. <laughs> so. Yeah, right, but <laughs> but it needs a designated expert, designated expert because you can't have uh, a specification required without a DE. You can have a, I you can have an IETF. You can have what? I'm sorry. I'm just staring at the right words. You can say standards action, and that can be without a DE, but that's always bad. So I'm just saying factually, we, we have in the in the existing RFCs that are quite old, yeah. specification required registries. And no DE. There was no designated there was no expert DE. ever. <laughs> well, <laughs> a, a comment on the ISG of the time. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so I think what's pretty clear is people want the guidance. And again, bear in mind that there's, a, there's an expert here who is an expert. So. The guidance doesn't have to be you know, something that is machine readable. Um, we want things that are open. We want things that are stable. We want things that are likely to foster interoperability. So for example, some academic papers might be great, but a lot of them won't actually have enough information to get interoperability. And, and that's, we can give the guidance to an expert. In, in, you know, it doesn't have to be very, very precise. It just has to tell them what to think about. And then we depend on the expert to, to make a good decision. So those are things are open, stable, and likely to foster interoperability. Yeah, all right. I mean, I'm, th thank you. Yeah, I mean, the thing I would kind of caution is when we think about what we want, imagine the working group is gone. Yes. Who are you going to trust with the code points? Because that's pretty much what's going to happen. It's going to be the DE making a recommendation to the ISG uh, plus that DE may be consulting a working, uh, I'm sorry, a mailing list, but it's going to be, you know, what, what do you want that group of individuals to tell the ISG? Yeah. I think we want something that is immutable to the level, like a draft is mutable, but if you specify a specific version, it's going to stay there and be immutable. So, so that, that's I don't, what we want. I don't know if Ayana will put a specific version number of a draft in as the reference for a code point. It's, I don't know. <laughs> Sorry, There's likely going to be a lot more specification requires that are much weaker than a draft. So I'm not sure the draft discussion is really that interesting because they can just put it on the website and not call it the draft. Um, 
you should really think about I, I, I don't think adding features that might not get deployed widely is a problem if, as long as the registry is big enough. Do we have any registries that are so small that we want to avoid wasting numbers on them? And if you don't have that problem, then I think specif specification required is most suitable for most of them. Yeah. Okay, so I think so. I think it sounds like the the guidance essentially is open, stable, uh, and likely to foster interoperability. And we need to figure out some words to say that and put it into the IANA considerations. Um, who who wants to take an action to craft that into words? I get DKG. You you and I should probably do that, right? And we should we'll, we'll hunt around for other RFCs that have such guidance and try to find a good example to 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 base on. Ori? But just because I'm looking at the, the IANA COSI registry right now, there's several entries that point to specific draft numbers, just for reference. I okay. suggest looking at the IANA COSI and COSI registries for, for guidance. Sure. Okay, so I think the action there is on the chairs to come up with a bit of text to and I think the, the, the feeling of the working group is, is clear. We'll see if the text uh, generates objections or not. But okay, DKG? Yep. Cool. And your last slide was just a question. Just now, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, okay. Aaron, I recognize that we have 10 minutes left in the, in the um, slot here. And we had offered a potential chance to talk about post-quantum work. We already did a bunch of talking about post-quantum uh, in the extended uh, in the salt discussion, um, <clears throat> do folks have any other uh, issues that were raised uh, during working group last call that you want to discuss now, or do you want to try to give Aaron, you know, five to ten minutes to talk about the post quantum stuff? I don't know if that's a fair slot for him. I don't see anybody in queue. Okay, so so I guess we're, we're we've got a few people agreed to do reviews additional reviews we've got some actions to change that means we're extending the working group last call essentially um by some number of weeks dkg and i will discuss off list and uh declare another date for it and, and hopefully that will encourage people to do those reviews by that date that's okay um should i do the slide sharing locally here dkg it might be easier sure Yes. Uh, so I think you need to stop sharing or I need to take it away from you. Thank you. Preloaded slides. There we go. So just tell me when to move along. Yep. And, and and we're we're at seven minutes, so you might want to go faster yeah. than you expected. Definitely. So uh, we're going to present uh, BQC in OpenBGP, what has been done so far, and a few questions for for the working group. The people in bold are the one actually working on the draft right now. Next slide. We'll start with the design criteria. Design criteria. Next slide. Uh, yeah, <laughs> they're a bit redundant. So the idea, the main ideas are to use composite multi-algorithm for Kyber and the lithium and standalone Sphinx Plus to offer backwards compatibility to have two certificates, uh, to recommend the user to have two certificates, one v4 legacy with uh, basically pre-quantum and, and legacy uh, for legacy implementation and one v5 with post-quantum or v6 at this point. And to ensure compatibility on the protocol level, of adding multiple signatures, so you sign with both uh, with both keys. Uh, we use ECC, so we would, since they are new algorithms, we would basically fix the existing inconsistencies. Use actual X25519, X448, as they are uh, as they are um, standardized. Next slide, please. So these are the algorithms we thought of. And to maintain consistency with the crypto refresh, 25519 in must, 448 in should, and everything else in may. Sphinx, we, off we thought about offering both SHA-2 and Shake. 
The reason is Shatu is twice as fast, more than twice as fast as Shake. And it's not even not it's not really a security comprom a security trade-off, seems like. But shake for future compatibility with what comes next. Next slide. Uh, Sphinx Plus will have several uh, uh, parameters uh, because uh, some users might want to have smaller signatures but very slow. So this means like 256S that takes even seconds to be issued. Um, but all these signatures are very fast to be verified. So on the verification end, uh, there should be no issue. So it's just the signer who decides how slow they want to make their work. Next. Um, so basically, the basic design for the CAM is to use ECDH uh, as like a prime curve <clears throat> or X2519 or X448 and omit the key derivation step and just key, the derive everything. So the key encryption key is derived from ECDH with Kyber and with some fixed information. It's a simple SHA3 concatenate and hash construction. Because of the sponge construction of SHA3, we can, we can do that. Next slide. So these are the topics that we already talked about. Uh, next slide. Uh, so is basically the fact that they are not simple, like they expect the both the, the, the whole data, the whole message to be fed into the algorithm. We cannot really do that because we do streaming. So we, we can't expect, we don't have the information about the signature at the beginning. Uh, unless we put it into the one pass signature, but it would be a big change on the protocol level. And this is as much as we're doing right now with EDDSA that also expects the whole message as input. So we basically are asking to extend the hash size as we said before, even though as Scott pointed out is a good point as an online attack still and 16 octets are pretty large number. So it's just that there would be an inconsistency and that would not provide the whole security of Sphinx Plus. Uh, the lithium prepends the public key, but that is still fine in, in our opinion, because it just uh, ensures that, like the, 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 that will still be there just after the hash. And yeah, next slide. And basically these are the differences. Uh, the fact that we want to, in the future, bind the hash algorithm to the um, embedded hash algorithm into the post quantum algorithm. So basically, say you cannot use SHA2 to then create a signature that is the lithium that uses internally SHA3 as much as the salt size. Next slide. Yeah. And also, this is a big problem that we have nowadays, uh, especially for um, my messages. Clients tend to parse just the first signature if it validates good. If it doesn't, well, it's not validated. And if we want to put multiple signatures, we need to ensure that there is compatibility for this. And also in open PGP messages, so in the embedded signatures, we need additional testing in interoperability suite that is not done as of now. But this is an action item we have on our side. Next slide. So next steps, we would like to wait for the publication of the Kyber intellectual property from NIST that they told us yesterday, mm -hmm. <laughs> it would be done tomorrow. So sorry, by this month. So uh, um, I, I will very warmly looking for that. We also would like to publish the draft we have right now. We wanted to do it by now, but we still some parts are missing. And we do have an, an experimental Go implementation at Proton and MTG will work soon on to uh, open uh, libgcrypt and RMP implementation and also improve the testing suite to include that missing tests. Um, next slide. So in the last minute, uh, I would ask if anyone has comments, questions, please come to, uh, sorry, these are the questions we have for you. And they are the algorithm selection, if you like it, uh, whether you're okay with binding the signature size to the hash ID that we already discussed, and whether you would be okay with also the further change of the hash function to the algorithm ID. Now, I don't think we have time for questions, but uh, we are having a meeting in next slide, in 20 minutes or so at mezzanine 12, where we will see the draft for real and we will discuss. We can discuss it 
all together to see. Since this is not chartered work, we did not want to take time from this meeting for it. But uh, if someone has a quick so note. just uh, yeah. before you go down, uh, um, so I'm going to suggest we'll we'll try and finish the working group last call on the crypto refresh, get that to where we hit the publication request button, and then have an interim meeting where we can discuss rechartering. Do we have a timeline on when that's going to come? We, people promised some reviews within weeks, so and then Paul has been quite quick as editor, so I would hope in a, in a month, six weeks, something like that. So but, yeah, why not? Very great. Just trying to get into work. So. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, Quinn, go ahead. Yeah. And, uh, and we're out of time, so be very quick, just, please. Just, just uh, in case, I'm Quinn Dagger. Just, just in case you didn't attend the uh, CFG meeting on Monday, i uh, just let you know um, I strongly expected the... Uh, the detail of our agreements with the two patent holders uh, will be uh, released uh, this month. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Um, thanks, Aaron. Sorry you didn't have too much time, but we, no. you know, I mean, things to discuss. That's why we booked the meeting. Yeah. So if you're interested, go to that side meeting. And <laughs> this won't be this won't become a chartered item until there's an interim meeting anyway. So so you you won't you won't totally miss out on anything. So okay. Thank you all. Um, Let's try and get this crypto refresh thing done and out the door, and then we can move on to these topics. And thanks to our minute takers as well. Okay. All right. Thanks to Kenji. Hope to see you next time. Thanks. Yeah. Sorry for the short, short amount of time. I'm actually all my fault with the. You at your own time. Yes. <laughs>